Okay, we're going to get started because people are flowing in from around the world. And a very warm welcome to a very different security thought leadership webinar. Uh, as you know, we're normally here on a Tuesday and Thursdays at 3.30, and this is a Wednesday and it's 1.30 Greenwich Mean Time. And that's because this is a special webinar and one with a bit of difference to it. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to be launching the report from the Security Research Initiative. And the Security Research Initiative is uh, uh, something that's been going now for 17 years. Uh, this is where we ask the sector to support an annual research study. And I'm very grateful for our supporting associations, ADS, ASI's UK chapter, BSIA, and Security Institute for their report, for their support. Um, and uh, um, they've been involved for a long time now. And there are the details of where you can find this report. It's about understanding the influences on a security career. And we manage to do this every year through the support of a range of companies. And I'm very grateful to these. They all supported this research. They all sponsored it. So Sodexco, SIA, Securitas, PwC, OCS, Mighty, MS, KPMG, Interserve, Inter, ICTS, Bifford, Noonan, and Axis Communications. So thank you very much indeed to all of them. And the topic is one that is really very, very important. It's about where, where do we go with this thing called security careers? And uh, what I'm going to do in a second is introduce my colleague, Charlotte Howe, to give you the headline findings. We'll tell you where you can download a copy, a free copy of the report. And once she's given you those headline findings, and I think in some ways they're quite surprising, uh, um, we'll then invite two uh, senior members of the security sector representing different organisations who are going to talk a little bit about what they've been doing to encourage security careers and to encourage the next generation of them. That's uh, uh, David Scott and Rick Milford. And I'll say a bit more about that when we've had the headline findings. But first and foremost, then, it's over to my uh, colleague, Charlotte Howe, who's the research manager at Perpetuity and was very much uh, leading on the management of this particular project to give you some insights on what we, what we did and what we found. Charlotte, over to you. Thanks, Martha. Um, so just to set the scene, really, the reason for looking at this topic is that it's clear that good progress has and is being made, but that presenting a better image of security is still a struggle. Previous research shows, um, and indeed it's, it's been discussed in previous webinars, that security is sometimes undervalued and the contribution made isn't always recognised. Uh, work in security isn't necessarily respected or, is my, or as my, admired as much as other careers. And in that respect, potential recruits are often thought to pursue other forms of protection and uniformed work in preference to security. We therefore wanted to get a better understanding of how security can be better presented. And to do this, we look to identify how professionals themselves view it, what impacted on their career choices, and what they see as the attractions and potentially the deterrence to working in security. Uh, we began by looking at the literature to inform the research and the key findings are based on a survey and also interviews um, that was done in the UK, but also worldwide. So we have quite a view of a, a range of, of different views and perspectives. Um, we sought to publicise the survey, for example, among networks for new or young professionals and we spoke to recruiters. And we sought to identify the views of both those that came to security as a first or first main career from those that came to security as a second or a subsequent career, those that built experience in a, in a different sector before moving into security. So there's lots of details in the report drawing on those different perspectives. Um, but for now, we'll take a look at some of the key findings. So moving to the next slide. Um, so just to think a bit about the roots into security. One of the key things that we found is that, as Martin briefly mentioned, people do seem to end up in security by accident. They find themselves in it, but they hadn't aspired to it. They hadn't sat down and, and formed that plan to go into it. Um, and this is echoed in the way that security careers had come to the attention of our survey respondents. It was apparent that there's no clear way that people hear about security as a career. Most commonly, but only a third had heard, had, had it suggested by a friend or a family member or colleague. Um, only 4% of our respondents had become aware of security from a careers talk while in some form of education such as school or college. 
There's also a perception that pretty much all security professionals are ex-police or ex-military. And certainly we know, you know, there is a link there, but actually there are plenty of professionals from other work backgrounds. In our sample alone, of those that had previously worked in other sectors before security, more than a third were from a commercial background originally. Um, and we also found that people just aren't aware of the opportunities provided by security careers. They simply do not know about them. Um, so if we want to attract young people, if we want to attract people with diverse experience, um, former experience, then we need to find a better way to tell people about what security careers exist, who security careers are for and what they offer. Uh, moving to the next slide. I just want to talk about some of the positives that came across in the research. Despite the somewhat negative image of security that can be held, actually the majority of those working in security said that they would recommend it to others as a career and also that they intend to stay in security. Now, interestingly, a small number of our sample had originally joined security to gain experience for a different career but the majority of those now intended to stay in security instead of pursue that other career. So clearly there are benefits and attractions that keep people engaged. Um, one caution though, is that the younger professionals in the sample were a little less likely to plan to stay in security. So we do need to think about how we, how we uh, retain them and not just how we attract them in the first place. One of the really interesting points is that the majority have a more positive perception of security once they are actually in it than they held prior. Not all, but a majority. And this is really important because it means that security careers are typically better than people realise. But it also shows that work needs to be done to ensure perceptions match the reality because it, it's no good keeping it a secret. To attract people, we do need to show the benefits and not just leave it to chance. Um, and we also looked at key attractions to a career in security. And respondents rated very highly the challenges presented by the work and the role to be played in protecting people and protecting organizations. Now, there has been criticism of security historically for having commercial motivations, but actually the people working in security really are committed to protecting others. It is something that they care about. As you would expect, making the most of existing skill sets was important, but a majority also valued the possibilities they saw for progression, so they saw a good career path there. Uh, professionals also talked about the opportunities in security, that there were so many different directions one could take, and they saw it as a benefit that there isn't a very restrictive route for progression like there can be in other careers. But it was also acknowledged that this could actually make it quite difficult to identify a career path and, and to plot a course to where they want to get to, simply because there are so many different options. Moving on to the next slide. Um, in terms of attracting people, security really seems to suffer for, from some outdated perceptions. So I just wanted to take a, take a minute to talk about those. We heard that there is an outdated perception that security is just about protection. Actually, it's clear now there are other skills that are re regarded as very important. Effective communication skills and customer service skills, for example. And actually, a large majority of our respondents felt that business skills were as important as security skills among the highest level of security management. So security is evolving, but perceptions are lagging behind. We also found that there are some perceptions which are thought to be off-putting to potential recruits. Some roles are seen as unskilled. There's a lack of understanding of what security work actually involves. And we've heard in previous webinars that the pandemic has helped to make the case that some of the roles previously perceived as unskilled are actually very valuable and very involved. Um, guarding in particular is not perceived to be attractive work, but this is largely what the public and others see and think of when they think of security work. But there are so many different aspects of security work in reality and so many different roles that potential recruits can pursue. So we really need to get away from these outdated perceptions. 
Um, the majority of our sample indicated that security is seen as an industry rather than a profession. So it's not necessarily viewed as a credible career, but we heard about so much work going on by associations, by regulators, by those involved in developing standards and qualifications that should really enable those in security to be recognized as professionals and outside of the industry or the profession, not just within security. There's also a perception that there's no career path, that security is just a job, but we've heard feedback from many professionals that have been able to progress, to be successful, that have enjoyed their work and the various challenges, albeit they may have had to work out for themselves how to get there. On the other hand, we've also heard about some security company initiatives to ensure that staff at all levels are developed and progressing. So there are many positive steps being made. Uh, now moving on to the next slide, Martin is going to say a few words about the challenges presented by these findings. Martin, back to you. Wait a minute. Sorry, I started talking and my microphone and, and I was on mute. All this criticism I've done of panellists for not turning on their microphones when it's their turn to speak and what do I do? Um, uh, thank you, Charlotte. Um, so let me just uh, sum up a few points, if I might, please. Um, this issue of uh, um, uh, careers in security seems to me to gone, have gone off on a massive incorrect tangent. And uh, we need to dispel some of the myths. And these are massive myths. And it's not unusual for the security sector to score an own goal. I think in all our aspects of it, we've done a few of these over the years. But let's start to change perceptions in quite a dramatic way. Um, the first myth is that security is not lucrative. Our interviewees stay in security precisely because it was lucrative. It's one of the points made. And that's because we've confused something. We've confused with the very sad, irritating, and very much needs to change experience of those on frontline roles who are typically underpaid with some, with some good exceptions. Um, who are at the lower end of the scale when it comes to pay. That is not typical of the security sector generally. Many people made the point that it can be very, uh, very, very lucrative. So let's just dispel that myth. The second thing is the security sector is out for itself. It's a commercial entity. It provides the opportunity to serve the public. People in the sector value it because it provides an opportunity to serve the public. Thirdly, that there's no career path. This is a nonsense. There is a career path. It's not regimented in the same way that it is for the army or for the police, say, which is often used as the relevant comparison. But there is a career path through. Companies have promotions uh, um, schemes and people can change if they put themselves in a position. You might have to look a bit harder, but the idea there's no route from the bottom to the top is a nonsense. And anyway, uh, one of the supporters of this particular initiative and indeed, a, a thought leader in his own right, Richard Stanley, uh, um, is well known around the sector from having been a security officer to being the head of security. I mean, it can be done and there are examples of it. And uh, uh, these sorts of factors have, have really plagued the security sector for years. And we really do need to start to think differently about the sorts of factors that characterize the um, security and the work that's involved and start to present a different interpretation so that we can begin to make it a, a, an attractive proposition. It is the most damning thing of all that one of the key reasons why people don't know about the security sector is be, don't join it is because they don't know about it and they've never thought about it. It is also very encouraging once they do and they join, then they're generally more positive. And particularly, of course, those who stay. Put all this together, we've got a giant misconception about what security is and the role that it plays and uh, uh, how it's presented. So it's against that background then uh, that I say to you that uh, um, I commend this report to you. In a minute, we'll tell you a bit more about where you can find uh, where you can find out, uh, uh, get a copy, and you can download it, read it free of charge if you haven't already. It's on the Perpetuity website. Uh, but what I would like to do at this moment is introduce uh, um, two um, uh, uh, supporters of this particular research. Both have, done, uh, both have done this. Both actually have previously appeared as thought leaders on our webinars. I know they're a big supporter of thought leadership. I'm gonna ask them to make a comment 
um, um, and, and outline the sorts of initiatives they're doing to take forward this idea of careers. They are David Scott from Skills for Security and Rick Mountfield from Institute. I'm just going to ask each of them to say a little bit about themselves, just 10, 15 seconds. And when they've done that, I'm going to ask them each to talk a bit about their own work in this area. And then what I'd like to do is open it up to the audience to ask any questions. If you've got any questions, can you please use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen? And uh, I will endeavor to get to them. And uh, David, Rick and Charlotte will, will be there to talk these things through. So, um, uh, David, can you just introduce yourself, please? Uh, David Scott here. Um, I'm the Managing Director at Skills for Security. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Martin. Um, one of the unique things about my situation is that I am an ex-Skills for Security apprentice myself. So with the research you've shown today, I am living proof that the sector really is a career of choice and I owe a great deal to ensure its sustainability over the future. Thank you very much indeed. And Rick, if you could introduce yourself, please. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, I'm Rick Manford. I'm the Chief Executive of the Security Institute in the UK. I am that career, second career military person, um, although I am massively um, invested in changing that perception. There is a place for second career military and police, but if we're going to address issues of diversity and inclusivity, we need to plan for the next 10 years to 15 years, and that means creating pipelines uh, for young people to get into the industry and keep them there. So that's where I'm coming from today, Martin. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So I'm going to ask um, each of them to make uh, uh, just some comments on these issues. Once they've both spoken, we'll open it up to the audience for questions and chat. So get your questions in at the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. If you can get them in as soon as possible, it'll maximise the chance of me including it. David, your thoughts on this subject, please. Thank you, Martin. Now, so Skills for Security are the largest fire and security apprenticeship training provider in the whole of the UK. And we currently offer training in both the physical and the electronic sector and, and our students come across the whole nation to attend training. We have students from Plymouth, Southampton, London, Manchester, Leeds and Newcastle who all attend Skills for Security to the highest quality education. But as well as that, we are a sector skills body that has a responsibility to engage with the sector to make sure that the skills the qualifications and the apprenticeships are fit for purpose for the sector. Apprenticeships are a prestigious career route for all people. And that's not my comment, that's actually from the government. But so many, but as so many of you are already aware, there isn't a recognised apprenticeship programme for the security officer or operator. However, times are changing. With the support of Skills for Security, BSIA and the SIA, and, and many others actually, the industry has came together to develop fit for purpose, high quality physical security apprenticeships, which will see an entry level, level two, and a higher level, level five and above, apprenticeship being deployed throughout the sector and across the whole of England. And this is the first key step, in my uh, uh, opinion, that the security would then become a career of choice. It would become attractive to those at school that it is a professional industry to work in because people value apprenticeship programmes. And that's going to be available from next year. And hopefully by Christmas next year, we will see our first intake of apprentices being registered on those programmes across the whole of the nation. Skills for Security are also working and investing time in the development of a recognised apprenticeship programme in Scotland. And that's actually going to be ready very, very early. We're expecting that to be ready next month with students being enrolled early next year. And that's a level two security officer apprenticeship, which will be available to all Scottish employers very early next year. So that really does take care of one problem, which is um, having a recognized apprenticeship program that sector can use, value, and, 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 and really clears the pathway um, for school children and others to, to enter the sector. But how do we actually attract people from school, college, university into the sector, making it a career of choice rather than what Martin's already highlighted in his report, a fallback career of choice? And at present, Skills for Security are working on two specific routes. Firstly, we work really closely with a body called World Skills UK, and they give us a unique opportunity to talk to 100,000 school children across the whole of the UK. 
And we already run successful competitions with World Skills UK in the electronics sector. But how good would it be if we could start to engage the physical security into those competitions, showcasing live job vacancies and some of the skills that a professional security officer would carry out on a daily basis. And that would really start us um, attracting a different type of person into the sector. And secondly, we're also working with the government just now to secure funding for what we call a traineeship programme, which would see us accessing funding to deliver training to school and college leavers with the integration of a four-week work placement that has a direct pathway to full-time employment and obviously one of the fantastic new apprenticeship programmes that we're currently developing and deploying through the nation. Skills for Security is more than just a training provider. We're here to solve a, solve a key problem, which is making the security industry that career of choice and also resolving that skill shortage that the industry sees. And that's it from me, Martin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Some really, really good points. Don't forget, if you want to get a question in, please use the question and answer button at the bottom of the screen. And I'll come to you straight after Rick's given his insights on this. Rick, over to you. We're interested to know what you're up to. Thanks, Martin. Um, firstly, I, I think um, what Skills for Security have achieved in the electronics and a physical security aspect has been remarkable. And I, I think that uh, is the probably the, the, the easiest sector, but it is a sector where um, there is an attractiveness because there is a trade involved. But a lot of security is not trade related unless you come from a policing or a military background, as I alluded to. So the way the Institute is, uh, is developing in partnership with many others is really in two, in two strands. It is in, uh, incentivizing kids to realize that, that what security is, and that needs a change in perception within the public. So we, we are targeting firstly in our next generation security, next gen uh, program, 14 to 18 year olds, we take them to trade shows like SCTX, IFSEC, International um, the Security Event, Police and Security Expo, about 50 kids at a time prior to the pandemic, and showed them the vast diversity of roles are involved. Uh, and I have a, you know, a great example of a, a young lady who was uh, engaged in her first year of her GCSEs to become a fashion designer, and following a day at that show, decided that she was no longer going to design fashion. She was going to design uniforms and protective equipment for EOD and specialist firearms officers. That shows in the textiles world that there is an opportunity for, for security career in the textiles are arena. Um, our next gen moved on into a partnership with the Ernst & Young Foundation. EY Foundation, takes kids from um, the poorer backgrounds. Any child that is, is, is technically getting free school meals can engage in a program uh, and we are running, we would have, we would have run one in July uh, this year, um, but it obviously couldn't happen. So the next one is planned for April, 26 children, all funded by industry so that uh, they can engage in business skills but focused on security. So that is in a corporate security sense. And EY Foundation, in fact, Martin, you spoke at the conference with that panel of children that were involved in uh, financial services, which was another EY Foundation program, were remarkable children from um, the uh, suburbs of London that wouldn't have had opportunities without EY Foundation's input. We are going to promote that within the security sector. That covers the uh, GCSE age kids, uh, so 17 to 18 year olds. We are now engaging the six year old to 12 year old bracket through the, the, uh, a channel called Fun Kids. Fun Kids is an online digital audio uh, radio station. You can Google it, it's brilliant. My, my 12 year old still loves it now. There was a very successful campaign with the Institute of uh, uh, Electrical Technologists, IET, that ran a program of educational pieces around smart cities, um, demystifying what 5G means to children when they're eight, nine, 10 years old, has a lot of power because they will grow up appreciating what that means. We will engage them 
to run a series of online cartoons on their website, but also on the radio with characters that will talk about different disciplines in security. So those children grow up knowing what security is bringing to them in terms of societal safety and security um, without scaring the bejesus out of them. But, but we'll show them uh, and engender a little respect. And most of them listen to these programs with their parents, 600,000 followers on their programs. Um, and lastly, we've just registered as uh, an intermediary employer under the Department of Works and Pensions Kickstart scheme. So you'll see some, um, some marketing come out. We've built a website. So what this means is if you're not aware of Kickstart, during the pandemic, all the uh, youths that left college and university and are now struggling to get into the workplace can, can have a paid for work experience placement of six months to go and work with an employer. Now, the big companies can take 30. You have to take 30 of these uh, students in. But if you cannot place 30 young people in your business, you can take one or two, but you have to group them into an intermediary. The Institute is registered on the gov.uk kickstart scheme as the intermediary for the security industry. We will place 30 school leavers into six month placements where DWP will pay minimum wage for 25 hours a week for those kids to work in that placement. And that business that takes them in, whether it be one or two or five, um, we'll get that minimum wage, also a £1,500 uh, one-off payment to, to cover things like business skills, CV writing, interview skills, um, being a good employee, which is all the stuff that we already provide for our members. So that is, is brand new. The Kickstart scheme only released in September and there have been no placements in any sector yet, but we are hoping to gather up 30 businesses minimum. We will take the funding from DWP and redistribute it to the, the smaller outfits. The idea is that maybe those kids then will have a job at the end of it, or they will be more aware of what's available in the security sector. This addresses the second career military and police um, predominance in our industry. By proxy, we will address the diversity and inclusivity problems that our industry has in not being gender fair, not having um, ethnic minorities rightfully represented across the sectors because there isn't an equal playing field to get into the sector unless you've been in the military or police. So the second half of, of what you covered here is around the um, retention of and career pathways. Well, what we promote is, is cross-decking. You know, you can have a career where you worked in retail, <clears throat> As a security officer, you can professionally develop, do some short courses, maybe do some bigger courses, become a security manager, go on to contract security management, sidetrack into aviation or go into construction and have a fulfilling career where you change disciplines at periods of years, maybe. But at least if you get bored in one sector, there's nothing stopping you from qualifying and moving across to another of the million um, op opportunities there are across the whole the whole sector, um, and this is this is something I was talking about on the S SIA um, conference this morning. There are a lot of initiatives going on upskilling the frontline security on license linked qualifications that will be at, coming out in April next year. Would have been out this April, uh, apart from this pandemic. That is increasing the skills and qualifications of our frontline security officers so they have more confidence, they have more pride in themselves, and that they are then respected and recognised by society, the police and government. All the things that the SRI research paper, uh, A Strategy for Change, highlighted in 2017, your, your research in 2017. Um, and I know I've seen Claudia is on here now. People like Claudia at the SIA are enabling that sort of training to happen in uh, in your own home uh, by uh, developing webinars and online training platforms for remote delivery of training. Nothing has to stop because of the pandemic. So I'll leave this last point is the Institute's involved at the minute uh, with 16 organizations in the construction of a cyber 
Security Council uh, to make this a profession. As Charlotte said, we are not seen to be a profession because we are not a profession. We have no professional body. Um, I find it ironic that we are creating a cyber security council which will regulate the way that the general medical council uh, governs doctors and the medical profession and we don't even have a security council yet um, it seems back to front to me and so there is no governance in that that way of, of regulating other than the front line so all there is is to incentivize and inspire people to be better at them and then create pathways for them to forge their own career pathway because it's just a, such a diverse industry that um, to, to develop a career pathway for one will not fit the, the other person. There, there has to be some um, ownership of your own career pathway, but if you're not aware of the opportunities, then you're limited by that knowledge. And what the Institute is trying to do is, is tell everybody um, what is available. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Rick. Uh, um, really, really good. So the good thing is, uh, um, uh, I think the research that Charlotte's outlined is suggest the sector hasn't positioned itself very well on this issue. And what David and Rick have said is, okay, but there are things going on. Let's go to some questions then. And uh, uh, Charlotte, I'll come to you first. I mean, one of the things Simon Chan is making in some of the observations he's making is that um, uh, the security sector uh, needs to sort of think rather differently about this. Charlotte, our research is suggesting we're off, uh, we're off on a tangent at the moment. What do you think the headline possibilities are for bringing about a change? It's one thing, isn't it, to say we've got it wrong. It's quite another to think, where do we go from here? Charlotte, any thoughts on what the headline issues are? Just a minute, if you wouldn't mind, Charlotte. I think one of the really key things is demonstrating to people that a security career can be for them and Rick gave a really good example of, of the person that was thinking about a fashion career and, and could adapt that to, to security and I think one of the problems has been that security professionals are seen as a specific kind of person, a specific kind of skills, a specific kind of background and actually people need to be made aware and they need to see examples they need to hear about people already doing it they need to understand what these different roles are um that it's suitable for different people you know that you can be female you can be from a different ethnic background you can be from a different country you know that it's not just a very specific um group of people that are suitable for security um, and that goes hand in hand, really, with understanding just the range of, of roles, the range of different careers. Everybody thinks of guarding, but there are so many different aspects now to security. And in the research, it was clear that, you know, that some some areas of security are very attractive and there's a lot of interest in technology. There's a lot of interest in cyber. Um, so. So, yeah, I think they're they're sort of key key things that need to be done to sort of raise awareness of, of what security actually looks like, who it's actually for. Yeah, thank you. I mean, David, let me come to you on this issue. Can I just add in, David, a point from Mark Burtonwood? And it's about how you position the very different options before uh, an audience, before a neutral audience, one just to, to, to get their interest. As Rick, I think, mentioned, it's slightly easier, isn't it, when there's a a specific skill set involved when there's a trade, so to speak. David, your thoughts on that? And then, Rick, I'm going to come to you with the same question, if I might. Uh, David, first. Yeah, no problem. I think um, one of the things when I was reading your research, um, one of the issues we all have is getting to the, the younger audience at school and college leavers. And I think some sort of mis myth buster um, putting together a marketing material that we can miss about the industry and how we combat those myths. and. Um, I think we've got the, the tools now to get that information out there to the, the, the right people, um, either through World Skills UK um, or the Kickstarter scheme that Rick is talking about. But we also have fantastic relationships with um, the DWP, where the BSI and the DWP are trying to um, create the security industry into a career of choice. And we're really targeting job centres and people that are unemployed so that they start to look at the security sector in a new light and the research that you've done Martin I think is going to be key to actually um, highlighting to people that the, the, the security industry is exciting, it's lucrative, it's not 
um, just standing on a door. It's, it's much more diverse and, and varied. And I think that um, these are some of the pathways that me personally will be looking to take advantage of with the research that you've done. Rick, same question to you. It's an important one, I think. Rick, you're talking, you're on mute, you're on mute. Schoolboy error. Um, yeah, jump, the jump off points, the jump off points for, for in, incentivizing or, or, or making kids aware, um, I think can be addressed at the college leavers. We, we, there are things like police uh, or uniform services courses you can do at college now that, that make um, kids aware of, of all the things that, that um, are engendered in a, a service career in a uniform, whether it be police or, or the Navy or the Army. Um, I was recently on a, a, a committee with a risk, um, risk academic looking at how this can be addressed. And I, I think that a college course that is based around security careers that highlights all the, the diverse opportunities would be a really pl good place to start um, in the way that the uniform services, public services courses is, is run why not have something that is there uh, for two work streams as well one for the college kids that would go into more vocational skills and then something that hits the universities around those that may be more academical uh, um, academically capable um, in the stem subjects to show them what's available in higher levels of engineering or cyber security and that sort of thing but coming back to the fun kids piece all of that starts with the the formation at early years education that um security has a has a has a place in society um to to quote uh, dave brooks who is a uh, dr dave brooks at edith cowan university spoke on our conference last week around science of security says that they still have overwhelming registration for their um intent their intelligence and analysis type courses predominantly being booked up by women by young women and all of the engineering and technical uh, type um, security courses being booked up by young men is that because at school boys are still encouraged to play with bricks and building blocks and girls are encouraged to think and do different things that are, are deemed to be more feminine and I think that this has to be addressed at a much earlier age because it's a wider educational problem Thanks, Rick. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point. This, I think. Let me just move on because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, um, uh, one of the things Matthew Porcelli said, and actually, oddly enough, he was on the webinar yesterday asking about careers, and he's come up with a question here about how we uh, um, um, get a sense of honour back into the entry level positions. And you know, there is this sense it's low paid. There is this sense it's unskilled. Um, maybe your myth buster, David, I like that, by the way, maybe your myth buster, David, does it, but it's a bit more than that, I think, isn't it? I mean, the strategies one can do to sell the difference. Yeah, I'm um, sorry to jump but I think it's a great point, I, but I do think uh, one of the earlier thought leaderships I, I've done with yourself, Martin, I highlighted that there's so much good work being done in the industry just now. It's just a bit fragmented, and, and that's what I see in your research a little bit. But how we correct that is through the, these apprenticeship programs, through all the things that Rick's talking about. And uh, once the once the the once we have a stable starting block, which will happen next year, the professionalism of the sector will naturally increase, and people will want to work in the sector because apprenticeships are valued. And the work that we're going to be doing with the traineeships, which I think is amazing. And um, that Rick is also doing something along the kickstart scheme because that is a very similar opening entry point to people coming into the sector. Um, and we're, that is exactly what the traineeship is. It's, a, it's about lower level uh, education where we can build in work employability skills and work placements. And again, um, as soon as people start to grow and develop on these programmes and naturally progress into full-time employment, and in the apprenticeship programs, it, it starts to it starts to build a, a, a definite career pathway, which in turn um, shows some sign of prof uh, professionalism. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me ask a, a question. I'm going to come to Charlotte first, and I'm going to come to Rick to respond. 
Charlotte, if on the basis of our research, what you might say, I mean, thinking beyond the young entrant now, to think more generally about those who are mid-career and uh, who have got opportunities in the security sector. What if we were to say something along these lines, which our research says you should say, something along the lines of, here is a diverse career, more diverse than the police and military put together. I can't prove that, by the way, I'm just sort of um, voicing a thought. More diverse than the police and military put together, more lucrative than the police and the military, and offers a chance to serve the public directly in challenging environments which uh, um, you can influence and control. Charlotte, isn't that what we should be saying to the world on the back of the research we found? Yes, it certainly is. Yeah, that's definitely the um, definitely what the findings show that that is the people that are in it and do enjoy it. They're the things they like. That's what's attractive to them. So it's really a case of of making that point to the others that d that aren't aware of what security can offer. Rick, here's our point. It's obvious. We changed the message. It's lucrative. You serve the public. It's more diverse than all the other options. Thoughts, Rick? Uh, I think um, different people are motivated by different things, Martin, and it's not always about money. If it was about money, people wouldn't come into this profession necessarily. So I don't think um, the remuneration is, is not always the key thing. It is public service. Most people that join into the security industry, like the police and the military, if I'm honest, uh, are joining in because they, they want to be... Um, provide a service they they value that more than anything and and taking out the, the the motivators that i think are the common denominator um people are motivated by uh, appreciation so given our appreciation is management skills um but also being valued and respected so that the what you perform is valued and respected that engenders a pride in what you do and engagement, and that is a retention tool. That's just management skills um, that applies to our sector as well. And I, but I think it's the the management uh, and supervisors of individuals, whatever sector they're working in, they should be mentoring, and they can they can create that environment. It is um, it is a leadership issue um, that you have to see and and realize the motivators in individuals, and then and then help them achieve what it is that they want to achieve. Uh, and mentoring is one of the key things that, that the Institute provides, uh, as many others do. But in a workplace, the mentoring in the workplace is fundamental for, for keeping people aware of what opportunities um, are available and keeping people engaged. And, and I think that's uh, absolutely key. OK, I mean, Rick, I agree with you entirely. I suppose my point is, is that the point about it being lucrative is we need to dispel the myth that it's low paid because that can be off-putting. So my point was not so much that people are attracted to money, although it strikes me some might, it's more that when they think it's low paid, it's not. Anyway, I'm gonna ask you one more question each. I'm gonna ask Rick and I'm gonna ask David, very brief, very brief. Uh, um, Rick, uh, uh, Eugene Posey says, why isn't security nationally recognized as part of the first responder team, fire, police, medical? Because that's a barrier to perceptions, isn't it? Okay. Very brief, Rick, please. Perceptions. It is perceptions because people don't value it, uh, and they haven't for a while. And hopefully, things will be changing. Um, and there are there are projects afoot to hopefully uh, try and change those perceptions. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. And uh, um, David, finally to you, you've only got thirty seconds for this answer. Uh, doesn't the apprenticeship levy impede the progression of, of, um, of officer careers, particularly? where profit margins are minimal and clients are reluctant to support the extra wage costs. David, it's a question from Paul Hare. Very briefly, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I don't think so. I think the levies there, um, but companies are already being pay, paying into the levy. It needs to be spent. If you don't spend it, it disappears. Um, so um, I don't think it does at all. <clears throat> OK, thank you very much. Indeed. Look, thank you very much to the panel, all three of you. David, Charlotte, Rick, appreciate your input. Uh, um, uh, um, fascinating insights and uh, obviously we'll pick up on these in uh, future webinars. Just to remind you all, you can get a copy of the report from the Perpetuity Web Research website, perpetuityresearch.com. Go there, download the report free of charge. I commend it to you. Um, um, obviously, I'm, I'm, I've, got, I've got a bias here, but it is free and it gives you a chance to find out what the issue is facing the, facing the sector. And thanks also to all those companies who proactively supported this uh, research. Uh, um, uh, very grateful to them. 
the SRI exists because of them. And if you want to become part of this, uh, write to us and let us know. Me, Martin Gill, I'm very happy to uh, talk to any of you if you want to become. 17 years we're in now, a report every year, they're all made available and all these companies are listed in the report and get mentioned in the dispatches because they um, um, uh, are proactive in their support of it. Thank you to them. Uh, very, very quickly, uh, just to let you know, the next project is already underway. It's on the impact of COVID-19 on security. And the key here is to look at the response to the pandemic. Now, look, it's not just about success and failures, important though they are. It's what's the future implications, how this is going to look. We're coming to you with a survey soon. So stand by for the survey and we'll be doing interviews and then a report in the autumn. It'll all be made available for everyone who takes part. You'll, you'll get a copy. Uh, just to say, finally, that uh, uh, we go through it all again, another thought leadership tomorrow. And tomorrow we're looking at security recruitment. Uh, uh, what is its role and what is being sought after post-COVID-19? Recruiters, actually, um, have got their real uh, um, insight into what's going on in the world. So we'll be looking to them for their insights tomorrow. Another international panel, another important discussion. Uh, next uh, Tuesday, by the way, just to say to you, um, what's in a name? Uh, we'll be continuing that, that, the, that theme about understanding what, the, uh, what, how, what we call things. Can we solve the confusion in the language of security job titles? Slightly overlapped what we were talking about today. Well, uh, um, we're here every Tuesday and Thursday, as you know. Uh, um, 3.30 is the normal time. Uh, thank you very much once again to our panel. Thank you very much indeed once to you, the audience, to all our supporters. I look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. And until we see you again, stay safe.